you know, throughout Christian history, we have seen many people do many things that came with a very high cost. Some of them seem strange. Others uh, cause us to wonder about the people themselves. Yet others cause us to be inspired. So why do these people, uh, why do even some of us do the things that we do in the name of the Lord? Why do we place ourselves in places where persecution may come? Why do we give up some of the things that others see as their freedoms and their rights? Why can't I have the same fun that others have? Now, if you know me well and you've listened to me over the past, you know that I say that tongue-in-cheek because... uh, I have not found any fun that others have that I'm not able to have that I desire because God is great. We have a few verses before us today, but they're not easy verses. Isn't that the way it is as we have come through Scripture time and time again in our study of Hebrews, in our study of 1 Corinthians? How many times have we come across passages and I've said, well, these are not easy verses. I think sometimes we find ourselves as believers taking the easy route, skipping those passages that are difficult and looking for the passages that make us feel good about ourselves. Um, I don't know whether to praise the Lord or say, oh, woe is me, um, because God has placed on my heart the desire to just preach the word, to start at the beginning of a book and go to the end, and whatever's there is there and have to deal with it. Uh, Sometimes it's really, really difficult. Other times it's uh, pretty easy. Um, But uh, I would like to do what others do and say, well, I'm going to preach through a book, and so I'll do uh, eight messages on the book of 1 Corinthians or ten messages out of the book of Acts or or other things like that, because then I can just kind of skip the hard stuff. God hasn't allowed me to do that, and, and so here we are today. Another verse that some of you may have never seen before or never noticed before. Some of you have struggled with and grappled with and, and some have found all kinds of theological discussions and debates about verses. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But we have these few verses and, uh, and we need to deal with them. But I, I, I'm going to caution you to be careful. You see, as human beings... And as believers, we've been taught to dig into the Scripture and understand every minute detail that's there. And I think there's a place for us to really understand what Scripture teaches and how it applies to our lives. But sometimes we have decided to go so overboard that we miss the real message that's being taught to us because we want to fight about the detail that's there. And I think that's the case in verse 29 of our text this morning. And so I want us to begin again and look at uh, starting in verse 29. And let me read just verse 29 for you. I'm reading from the English Standard Version and in my research today. I think this verse conveys the truth of what was written by Paul as well or better than any others. It says, Otherwise based on all the stuff that we've talked about before. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? I don't know if you've ever wrestled with that verse. Being baptized on behalf of the dead. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever contemplated what that's all about? Have you ever thought about what that means? If you've studied the scripture and you've studied that in depth, you probably are like me, you've struggled. As I went into this verse today, or or this week, and really started to dig into the verse, here's the first thing that I discovered. There are almost 200 different interpretations of what that verse means. And when you read any one of the 200, what you come back with, if you're trying to create a theological view is that there's shortcomings in every one of the 200 interpretations. Now, doesn't that cause you to think? 
Why would God put such a verse in Scripture if it didn't have value and meaning to us or if we can't understand what it means? You ever think about that? Why would God give us some of these difficult passages? Here is the perfect place that I would tell you that God did not put this passage here, or this verse here, to cause us to see how deeply we can dig in and understand exactly what it means. He put it there to emphasize the overall point that he's trying to make. And if we try to do something more with it than that, we will find ourselves in all kinds of heretical places. Let me explain to you what I mean. There are some religions that practice the baptism of the dead today. Uh, One of them is Mormonism. Mormonism practices this idea of somebody being baptized on behalf of somebody that is dead. And you say, well, where do you get that from? Well, there's a sense that you would believe from verse 29 that, uh, and it's one of the 200 interpretations, um, that there is a substitutionary baptism. And so I went to the Mormon website. I don't want to misquote or or impart upon them something that is not their beliefs. I went to their website and I said, what do they say about this particular practice? So let me share with you just a few things that, that they say. This is what the Mormons say about the practice of being baptized for the dead. They believe that you must be baptized in order to go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven if you're not baptized in their view. Okay? They also believe that after the body dies, that your spirit goes to a place where you can still hear the gospel and be saved if you never previously heard. Okay, so you get this? Your body dies, your spirit goes to some place. While your spirit is in that place, then you're able to hear the gospel presentation and choose to receive Christ. Ah, but you haven't been baptized, so you've received Christ, but you can't go to heaven. So if there is somebody who is still alive, who loves you enough and cares about you enough, then they can submit themselves to baptism on your behalf, and then you in the spirit world, having received Christ, if you choose to accept the baptism that that person gave to you, you are then free to go to heaven. I'm not making this up, folks. This is what the Mormons say. This is their belief. Okay? This is what they believe. And they get all of that from verse 29. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read verse 29, it doesn't give me near that much information. All it says is, hey, Corinthians, you guys are practicing being baptized for people who are dead. It also ignores the words of Christ. Remember what Christ said to the thief on the cross? Right? Today you shall be with me in paradise. So the implication there is that when Christ died, he didn't go to heaven, which creates a whole other theological discussion about everything else. Uh, And and we won't get into that today. Maybe a little bit more close to home for some of us. Uh, There is some debate in the Catholic Church about this particular verse. Uh, There are Catholic priests in in Catholic churches that practice this baptism for the dead. Now, they're far more constrained on what they do with it. Uh, It is not the specific teaching of the Catholic Church as a whole. It is a practice of some Catholic churches. But if you if you come from a Catholic tradition or are familiar with Catholicism, they too believe that you cannot go to heaven unless you've been baptized. Uh, where they run into a struggle is then what happens to, for example, an infant or even a child that's not been born yet, right? Because they do believe that the, the child... Uh, becomes a person, becomes a child at conception, 
And so if a child then would die in the womb, or a stillbirth would occur, or the child would die sometime shortly after their birth, that that child would then be condemned to hell because they have never been baptized. And so because that just doesn't make sense to any of us, that God would punish this unborn child, they have... Uh, come in some places to practice this idea that a child um, can be baptized, for example, if, if the child is stillborn or we find out that the child has died in the womb before it, it's actually birthed, um, that you can be baptized on behalf of that child so that child would not be condemned to hell and would have an opportunity to go to heaven. Um, you see this idea of baptism for the de dead, which for most of us sounds really foreign, is not foreign at all to many who would call themselves in one form or fashion Christian. Uh, but it does, in all these cases, tie to a works-based salvation that says in order to get saved and go to heaven, there's something I have to do as opposed to receiving Christ. Now, we can sit here for weeks and talk about all of the various forms of, of interpretation of what these verses mean. But you know, I, I discovered as I studied this and I tried to look for other biblical passages that talk about this, and, and I even tried to look through some of the historical things. Guess what I found? Almost nothing. There is no other place in Scripture that refers to this practice. There is no other place that we can go to to get a definitive understanding culturally or, or religiously that explains what Paul was talking about when he talked about being resurrected or, or being, being baptized on behalf of those that were dead. Now, I don't know what you do with that. I know what a lot of people do with that. They just shrug it off and go on. Okay, then, we'll just ignore it. But God did place it in his word, didn't he? God did inspire this. And, and we're told in Timothy that all of God's word is useful for teaching and correcting and rebuking. All of God's word is, is important for us to understand. So what are we going to do? What do we do with this passage? I'm just going to move on and pretend like it's not there. Not really. <clears throat> I want us to, to understand this passage in the way that I believe God intended. You see, Paul saw a practice that was going on in the Corinthian church. He nowhere in this passage mentions whether it's a positive or a negative thing. He nowhere says this is right or wrong. He nowhere says this is good or bad. He just says, you're practicing this idea of being baptized for the dead. But he says that in the middle of a discussion about the resurrection. R remember what 1 Corinthians 15 is about? He started the chapter by proving that Christ was raised for the dead. And then he moved on from there, and he talked about why if Christ was raised from the dead, we'll be raised from the dead, and if we're not raised, then Christ wasn't raised, and if Christ isn't raised, then we're not raised. And, and he's saying that there's a, an important, significant truth about us believing in, and, and even beyond believing in, trusting in the reality that there is a hope and a future for all of us because we will be raised from the dead. And the struggles and the trials of this life will be changed and they'll be gone. And we will live in a new place and there's a hope and there's a, a, a motivation that comes from living in that place that says, one day I'm going to be raised, my body's going to be raised, I'm going to have a new body, I'm going to live in the new heaven. I'm going to live on the new earth where Christ rules and reigns and the devil has been, has been completely subdued and eliminated. And I'm going to live there one day. 
and there's a hope in that, but, but there's no hope, and, and I'm lost. And what Paul says in the midst of that, he says, why would you even think about doing something like being baptized on behalf of somebody who's already died if there's no resurrection? If there's no resurrection, who cares? If there's nothing after death, then why bother? And Paul's saying to the Corinthians, and he's saying to us, this resurrection is so significant and so important. We do all kinds of silly things that mean absolutely nothing if there's no resurrection of the dead. And so without any judgment, now I believe we can make all kinds of cases for why the baptism of the dead, uh, or the baptism on behalf of the dead, makes absolutely no sense from other scripture. Uh, but Paul doesn't even worry about that. He's not even saying to them, guys, stop doing this stupid thing. He just says, if you're willing to do that, why bother if there's no resurrection? Now with that context, look at what he goes on to say. He says, there's, there's other things that you're doing. He says, we're in danger every hour in verse 30. We're living in a time now, this is what Paul's writing back then, but, but folks, think about what you just heard about Molly today. Think about what's going on in our world today. We have it easy, folks. We're being persecuted left and right as Christians today. Our government has decided that we're ineffective and unimportant. Right? And if you say things like, Jesus Christ is God or, or creation is true in the school systems. You could lose jobs. There's persecution that comes. But folks, we're talking about people in Mali who don't know if they're going to live tomorrow because an Islamic government is coming in and taking over. We're talking about people around our world who can't say who they are and what they do unless they want to be physically imprisoned or killed. Paul lived in a time, and the Corinthians lived in a time, it, it got worse shortly after that, but they lived in a time all of the apostles, short one, were martyred because they were Christians. People are being killed and, and crucified and, and, and burned at the stake and, and they're being uh, fed to the lions and, and they're going through all these atrocious, horrible things that are designed to please the rest of the people and to destroy Christianity. Paul says, why bother? Why bother? Well, we bother because... There's something greater. We're in danger every hour. Every hour, we never know what could come next because we claim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would they do such a thing? Why do we do such a thing? Oh, many of us maybe don't. Many of us have found that it's easier to get along in this world just to keep our religious views locked up. It's become so common in the United States that there's generations of people who have bought into the lie of Satan that says, my religion is a personal thing between me and God. Folks, that's a lie of the devil. It is not a personal thing. Oh, it's a personal relationship, but it's not a personal. That would be like me saying, my wife and I, that's a personal thing. I'm never going to talk about her. I'm never going to mention her. You're not even allowed to know who she is. That's a personal thing. We're the church. We're the bride of Christ. How ridiculous is that thought? It's a personal thing. Jesus has a plan and a purpose for every one of us to build his kingdom, to bring him glory. How can you possibly build God's kingdom or bring God glory if nobody knows that God is even part of your life? But see, we've bought into it because if we say something, we might get in trouble. 
Now, folks, I'm not saying that, that that's not real. That is real. If we speak on behalf of Christ, we might get in trouble. We might lose our job. That's real. We might not get that next promotion. That's true. That's real. There may be people who mock us and speak against us and in some parts of our world even kill us. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not saying it's not real. But think about this. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is my hope. So what if they kill me? What happens? My body may be buried. <laughs> Who cares? I'm going to go and be with my Lord. Well, the hope of the resurrection is our strength. Oh, we're in danger every hour. Why do we allow ourselves to submit to that kind of danger? Because the resurrection is true. Paul says, I die every day. Obviously, he didn't literally die every day. How would he write these words? Ah, but he says, but I'm crucified with Christ. Daily crucified with Christ. I, I willingly give myself, sacrifice myself to be crucified with Christ, to give up those rights, to give up those things that other people have. Why? Because of the hope of the resurrection. One day I'll walk with Him. I die daily, but I do it for the sake of the gospel. We wouldn't care about other people if not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why bother? Why bother? We're all going to be buried and our bodies are going to deteriorate to nothingness. If that's it, then why bother? Who cares? Paul looks and he says, but there are people who are dying and they too will have resurrected bodies one day but if they don't know Jesus, it won't be a resurrection to heaven. It won't be a resurrection to God. It will be a resurrection to eternal separation from God. It'll be a resurrection to hell. And I care. How could I possibly say that I love somebody or care about somebody and not care if they're going to spend eternity in hell? It's the hope of the resurrection. The challenge that he gives, he, he says in verse 32, I fought with beasts. Now some think that maybe he was put in those Roman uh, coliseums and had to fight with the, the lions. Uh, I've never heard any real stories besides Daniel of people, Christians being cast to the lions and living. So I very much doubt that that's in fact what took place. But he says, I fought with beasts. Uh, he's referring to his battles with the rulers and the authorities wherever he went. Paul was constantly being put on trial and taken before rulers and authorities. He fought with the beasts. He fought with the battles in the darkness of, of the world that's around us, the unseen. He fought with those over and over again. He fought the beast. He says, but do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. Give up the worthless pleasures. If there's not a resurrection, then why not just eat, drink, and be merry? For what else is there? Why bother? Uh, blend in with the world, for there's not real consequence to your own sin or your lives. Uh, so we could die sooner or, or maybe not. I've told many of you, the doctor told me one day that if I gave up donuts, I'd live five years longer. I said, who wants to live five extra years without donuts? <laughs> I mean, let's face it. What's the alternative? Right? If there's no resurrection, who cares? Who cares? But it's time for the church in Corinth and it's time for the church in America to wake up because there are many who are living the life of the world all around us, both in the church and outside the church. 
There are many who indulge in sexual pleasure. Many who indulge in drinking and drugs. Many who indulge in all sorts of worldly pleasure. That's what Paul's talking about here. He says, give up the drunkenness. Give up all of that stuff. Many who follow the wrong crowds. Many today who have no knowledge of God. You don't think that's true? We have a generation of young people today who have never heard about God. Their parents are unchurched or dechurched and no longer living in a way that would ever experience or, or bring the experience of Christ into their home. You might not even find a Bible in the house. They've never been to a church service in their whole life. We are surrounded by young people who have never heard about God. We are the least evangelized country in the world today. Did you know that? The United States of America is the least evangelized country in the world. The pygmies in Africa that we talked about generations ago have heard more about Christ than the average American. Isn't that amazing? Why? So we bought into the lie. We bought into it. And we sit quietly and comfortably in our churches. And trust me, I've been to enough churches and I've met with enough pastors to know there are people right now in this community sitting in churches that will not hear about God today. That breaks my heart. To have somebody say, I'm called to be a pastor, but I'm not going to worry about what the Bible teaches because my people don't want to hear that. There are people around us today who, who will say, well, you can come in and you can preach here. You have 15 minutes to speak and, and if you don't reference the Bible, that's okay. I preached in a church one time and I referred to Moses in my message and the people glazed over and I started to pursue and they had no idea who Moses was. Now, you may not know everything about Moses, but you can't hardly turn on the TV anytime around Easter and not see the Ten Commandments. I mean, the name was foreign to them. People, we have a world that's dying not to be buried in a grave, and that's the end. But are dying unto resurrection. That because of the rejection of Jesus Christ today, will spend all of eternity in hell. And what's a shame is God told us in the book of Romans, He said, you know, I understand that, that some people may not hear in the traditional way. I understand that some people may not have a missionary. Shame on us for allowing that to be. But He says, I understand. I have given enough evidence. I've given enough evidence in nature to prove that there's a God that should at least inspire you to look for something. And we have people that will fight and argue with us that this is all randomly chance. Why bother? Folks, if we're just protoplasm the next generation down the line, then forget it. It's not worth it. If we came from the use and slime and we're going back to the use and slime, who cares? God cares. He cares enough and He wants us to spend all of eternity with Him so badly that He sacrificed His own Son to make a way for our sinfulness to be forgiven that we can spend eternity with Him. Perfect. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ did for us. Because of what God did on our behalf.
hard to believe that there are people in the United States of America that have absolutely no knowledge of God, have never been exposed to the Bible, have no idea what it says, maybe have never heard the name of Jesus Christ outside of a swear word. And if they believe in heaven, they think that they're going to get there because the scales are going to fall in their favor, because they're good people, because they've done this or they've done that, because they've been baptized or somebody's been baptized for them, because they've read their Bible or because they go to church or because they gave money to a charity. People are not going to heaven because of any of those things. People can only get to heaven because they understand that they're sinful people and they need a Savior and that Jesus Christ came. And made that choice to give himself for them and shed his blood for their sin. People will get to heaven because they will see in the church people who live a better and a richer life. But not based on the, the measurements of the world, not based on money, not based on power, not based on position but people who love them so much that they take the next step, that they go the extra mile to make sure that people's needs are met. Not just their physical needs, while that is important, but their spiritual needs. Because somebody has enough courage and enough love and enough concern to say, Jesus loves you and wants a relationship with you. And when they see the manifestation of that love in our lives, it's something that they desire for themselves. People get to heaven because we live with the hope of the resurrection and it changes our lives for the better. And they'll get there because we explain to them how they can have the same life and the same hope. Paul ends with these poignant words. Did you see that last phrase? He said, I say this to your shame. He says, if you're not actively obeying the Lord with that which He has given to you and living out your life for His glory, shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on me for every day that I live for me instead of him. Shame on me for every conversation that I have that is about me, my rights, my self-esteem, uh, my well-being, not about God's glory. Shame on me for every time I do or say something that doesn't point people to a resurrected Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word again and, and your truth and, and how poignant it is. And Lord, forgive us for the times that we want to take a, a particular verse of Scripture that, that, that has a, a purpose and intent and, and we want to try and build some kind of theology around it because that's what we have to do uh, to make our minds feel like we're smarter or better or understand because none of that is about you. Lord, thank you for the, the, the poignant words that Paul penned in this passage. Oh, are we willing to do that which is difficult, that which is hard, that which does not bring ourselves glory but points people to you? Are we willing to do those things regardless of the outcome, regardless of what it may mean, regardless of the difficulty and the pain it may cause even in our own lives? Are we willing to do that because we love somebody else that much? You did. Jesus, you loved us so much that while we were still sinners, with no relationship with you, with no desire for a relationship with you, you came and you willingly gave yourself for the beatings and the, and, and the plucking of your beard and the, and the crown of thorns 
You willingly gave yourself. You left all the glory of heaven to come and to walk on this earth so that we could be resurrected to be with you. How little we're willing to give. Lord, give us the courage and the strength and the desire and the love for your people so strongly, so much, that we would willing to endure the persecution and the struggles and the pain for the sake of the resurrection of the saints. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.